This is going to be Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to look at being a follower of God and a child of light. So Ephesians 5 verse 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. How many Christians can say they are a follower of God? How can a person say the King James Bible is outdated when the words fit today's language so well? How can they say that they're a follower of God when they don't believe his words? And what is it that people do on social media? They hit the follow button. The follow button. Yet they say the Bible's outdated. Uh, be ye therefore followers of God. It talks about following Paul. Uh, you follow men. The Bible talks about following men. Most aren't following God or men who are following God, but they are following a God to the point they want to know when their God gets a haircut, when they go to the bathroom, and when they go out to eat. So they follow them on Facebook and Twitter. But be ye therefore followers of God as dear, dear children. What kind of children? Children of light. And many times the closest they get to the light is the iPhone screen lighting up their bedrooms at night while they're staring at it. But be ye followers of God, and ye can do this through following men. If the man is following the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, 2 says, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. So walk in love. Amos said in Amos 3, 3, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Uh, Jesus Christ is love. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, according to Paul. And we love him because he first loved us. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Walk in love by walking with Jesus Christ. Anytime you sin, you lack love. Anytime you wrong your brother, you lack love. You're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. And if you do this then you won't have to worry about committing adultery, taking your brother's wife. You love your brother too much to take his wife. Uh, you, don't wanna, you won't covet your neighbor's wife. Um, you won't bear false witness. You're not going to lie to somebody that you're loving in the right way. Uh, you're not going to be a sodomite. You wouldn't be loving the person you were committing sodomy with. Uh, you're not going to play wicked music because you don't want the people around you that's in your life that you love to hear that music. If you love your neighbor, if you approach life by saying, I'm going to love that person and I'm going to show them how I love them, then watch your sin decrease. Because if you think about it, all the bad things you're doing, you're doing it because you lack love towards someone in some way. And the verse said in Ephesians 5, 2, that Christ gave himself... For us, an offering and sacrifice to God is a sweet-smelling savor. And Isaiah 53.10 said, It pleased the Lord to bruise him, because he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. It pleased God to bruise the Lord Jesus Christ. The wrath of God on sin was placed on Jesus Christ, and he became the propitiation for our sins. He appeased the wrath of Almighty God, and it was a sweet savor. Uh, your self-righteousness stinks in the nostrils of God, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ that gets imputed to you the moment you believe the gospel, it's a sweet smell to God in heaven. So if you're a child of light, then follow the God who is worth following. Walk in the light as he is in the light. He is the light of the world. If you go the opposite way of him, then you're just going to end up being a blind leader of the blind and fall in a ditch. So follow God. And number two, forsake sin. If you're one of the children of light, fight sin like you're fighting fire or fighting an enemy on the front lines in war. Ephesians 5.3 says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint. So fornication, uh, having sex with someone you're not married to, uh, any any time you go to bed with someone who isn't your wife, it's fornication. Adultery is fornication, but fornication is not always adultery. Fornications, fornication can be sexual relation between two people that aren't married to each other, 
or anyone else. Or it can be a sexual act between two people that aren't married but aren't married to each other. Uncleanness is moral impurity. Your soul has been cleansed by the blood, but your flesh needs a daily cleansing with the blood to keep your fellowship in check. And if you're a child of light, you need to stay clean. Your own light might get dingy and smudgy with your sin, and you need to forsake your sin and let God clean it off of you. Covetousness. Covetousness is wanting something that is unlawful to have. If you want something your your neighbor has, that's covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, as it says in Hebrews 13, 5. With food and raiment, let us be there with content. And many today are only out for what they can get next. And this is why they live paycheck to paycheck many times. They can't be content with what they have. Ephesians 5, 3 said, To let it not be once named among you as become a saints. Don't let anyone think you're doing this stuff. Just don't do it. Uh, Ephesians 5, 4 gives them more things you shouldn't do, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. If you're a child of light, then stay away from filthiness. Second Chronicles 29, 5 says to carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. If you're putting filthy stuff in you as a Christian, then you're putting filthy things in the holy place. Because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It is the holy place. You're putting stuff in your eyes and ears that would make the average Christian, who was around years ago, it would make them cry or puke or go crazy. But that's what Christians are putting in their head today. That kind of stuff. That filthiness. And the foolish talking. Ecclesiastes 5.3 says, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. If you wouldn't open your mouth so much, you could save your testimony. You could save the testimony of others, and not make yourself look like the fool you really are. Every man has foolish things on his tongue. Uh, people ask me why I'm so quiet. I don't talk much most of the time. And it's because if I shut up, then people won't know how stupid I actually am. The Bible calls the tongue a world of iniquity. If you can shut your mouth, then you're not going to gossip as much. You're not going to cuss as much. You're not going to say wicked things as much. And you say, well, I've got that, all that under control. Well, maybe, maybe you do, and that's good. But your, your tongue is still wicked. The Bible says it is. And you're not going to have a perfect tongue till you get a perfect body. Your tongue has its own little world, and the world on your tongue couldn't be inhabited by man. And this is because the tongue is a killer. It is set on the fire of hell. Also, no jesting. If you keep your mouth shut and don't open it when it's not necessary, then you won't have to worry about this either. God isn't against being funny or having a sense of humor, but everything isn't a joke. And many times today I hear preachers use jokes and mockery to teach against a Bible doctrine. And they do this because they don't have any Bible to teach what they are teaching. So they use humor and mockery and jokes to win over the heart of the people listening. In Ephesians 5.5 5 it says, For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now notice, whoremonger, unclean person, and idolater in Ephesians 5.5 5 will match what we talked about earlier. The unclean person matches uncleanness. Covetousness makes you an idolater. Uh, wanting something so bad that it is unlawful to have is covetousness and idolatry. Uh, whoremongers are the fornicators that we just talked about. At Colossians 3, 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. If a Christian is any of these things or lives a lifestyle involving these sins, then he will not have any inheritance in the kingdom, as the verse said. And someone will quickly say, does this mean he goes to hell? No, it doesn't. He can't go to hell. 
He just won't have inheritance in the kingdom. He will still go in, but he won't have the rule and the rewards like a faithful faithful Christian will have. We don't inherit salvation. Uh, so when it says, shall not inherit the kingdom of God, it's not saying that you're not saved or you're not going to stay saved because you don't inherit salvation. It's a free gift that we presently possess. So Ephesians 5, 5 is not, a, my, uh, not about a man losing his salvation. It's just a reminder that a child of light needs to forsake his sin. So a child of light forsakes his sin, and a child of light will also flee from deceivers. Ephesians 5, 6, and 7 says, Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. And then Second John 1, 10 through 11 says, If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So if someone is bringing false teachings around you, then stay away from that person. Flee any temptation you might have to believe the heresies that he's spewing out at you. The wrath of God will be on the deceivers according to Ephesians 5, 6, and it calls them children of disobedience. The Bible also talks about a child of hell, children of the devil. Second Peter 2, 14 talks about cursed children. Uh, everyone in the world isn't a child of God. And when Christians call lost men children of God and say that they're made in God's image, then that person won't realize their guilt of sin. They'll think they're pretty good. They'll think they're going to heaven. Uh, he'll think God is going to accept him as he is. But God's not going to let you into heaven as you are. You need the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on your soul. But a good deceiver will make you think God will let a man go to heaven just like he is, without the blood. But you're no good, and you need the perfect, spotless record of Jesus Christ imputed to your soul. And this only comes when you believe the gospel and get born again. So, a child of light will forsake his sin. A child of light will flee from deceivers. And a child of light should also be a fruit bearer. Ephesians 5, 8, and 9 says, For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the world. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. A child of light will walk in goodness, righteousness, and truth. And if you look at Galatians 5, 22 through 26, it gives us the fruits of the Spirit. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are, that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. It seems like people today are doing that last verse. They're being desirous of vainglory. They're provoking one another and envying one another. They envy this person, so they provoke that person, and then that person retaliates when retaliation belongs to God. God said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. It's not up to you to get vengeance on somebody. But the average fruit inspector provokes others and he envies others. And he's desirous of vainglory. He's the one who looks for outward evidence and salvation and hardly ever looks for the actual fruits of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians 5. They're looking for someone who doesn't commit adultery or smoke dope or watch porn or uh, go out and hit people, whatever sins that even the average lost person is ashamed of doing. They overlook the fact that the Christian who doesn't smoke or fornicate still has a problem with patience, with pride, with being not joyful in the things of God, or even has a problem loving other Christians. They overlook these these things. They're not focusing on love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness goodness and faith they're focusing on what is this person doing outwardly 
Are they doing certain sins that I don't do? That's where they're looking for evidence at. And while the fruit inspector may not be doing things that are considered wicked to the world, like shacking up and robbing people, they can't even do something simple like being nice to a waitress at a restaurant. They can't do something simple like being happy when something good happens to someone else. And I have more respect for a cigarette-smoking Christian who has a nice spirit about him than a loud-mouthed, jealous, gossiping Christian woman who doesn't do anything bad, but she just goes around and judges everybody. And while Christians should be fruit bearers, the fruit, good or bad, is a separate issue from the salvation itself. And it is evident that Paul teaches good works don't have anything to do with salvation. And that would include after salvation. All the good and bad things you did before salvation. You know none of them things had anything to do with the salvation itself. And then after you're saved, all them good and bad things you do have nothing to do with your salvation. They can't make you keep it. They can't make you lose it. It's a completely separate issue. And if people could understand that, then they're not going to doubt their salvation. They're not going to go around judging everybody's salvation. If they realize the works, good or bad, are a completely separate issue from the salvation itself. If a Christian is doing something wrong and not bearing fruit, uh, I don't see why we should judge their salvation. Pray for them and pray to God that they will get right with God and get saved if they're not saved. But what's the point of judging their, whether they're saved or not? I don't see in the Bible where we are to find out if a brother is really saved. But it does say to examine yourselves. I can examine myself. I know what's going on inside me. I don't know what's going on inside someone else. I don't have super spiritual eyes to see if someone is indwelt by the Holy Spirit or not. I mean, now you got to have sense. You don't want to make someone, uh, some big uh, preacher or Sunday school teacher or t uh, teacher in your church who you don't even believe is saved, that's not even trying to live right, that doesn't even know the Bible. But if if a brother or sister who claims to be born again is out in the world and living like the, wor the world, what's the point in saying they're not saved and all this stuff? Why not just pray for them? Pray that they'll get right. And pray to God, say, if they're not saved, I pray that they'll get saved. But you can't judge someone's salvation off outward evidence. It can be counterfeited. And a false prophet can counterfeit the Christian walk. That's why he deceives people. And there can be people who uh, who are saved, but you've met them at a time in their life when they're not living right. So you think, well, they're not saved because of the things I see them doing. And I know you can't help that. If I see someone that doesn't seem to be giving God a thought and they're not even trying to live right, it pops in my mind, though they're probably not saved. But we don't know that for sure. That's what I'm trying to get across. The Bible talks a lot more about examining yourself than looking at other people. You need to examine yourself, judge your own selves, uh, you know what's going on inside you. You don't know what's going on inside the other, that other person. But children of light should be fruit bearers. I mean, you should bear fruit. You should live right. You shouldn't do bad things. And when you say that uh, you can't judge a person's salvation by outward evidence, immediately someone comes along and says, uh, well, you just believe a person can live however they want to after they're saved. And that's not true. You should be a fruit bearer. You should act right and do what you're supposed to do. And a ch child of light should be a fruit bearer. And he should find out what's right. Ephesians 5, 9 says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Ephesians five ten says, Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So make sure what you're doing is right. Make sure what you're teaching is right. And if a new doctrine rises up, find out if it's right. 
find out if it's wrong. It's hard to prove all things when you don't know what's going on. And the average Christian has no idea about the war going on today over Bible doctrine. They are stuck on the milk. And they they wouldn't even be able to defend their belief that they have held for 40 plus years. They don't realize there are men rising up who actually study. And while their doctrine is wrong, they know more Bible to prove their own false doctrine than the average Christian knows to defend his own sound doctrine. And a man that is wrong on something can study so much to defend his belief that he'll be the one who turns out to look right on a subject even though he's wrong on the subject. Because the Christians today, they may have the right doctrine, but they don't know why they believe and what they believe in. They just believe in it because someone told them. Most Christians have taken for granted that they have the right doctrine that's been passed on to them, and they believe it only because their daddy or their granddaddy said it, and so they didn't take the time to study it out for themselves like the Christians in the past. Therefore, they don't really know it. They just believe it. They may believe the right gospel, but they couldn't find it in the Bible. They may be premillennial, but they don't know why, other than because their mother and daddy were. And this makes them unprepared to handle any false teacher who lies in wait to deceive. The average Christian, especially in the South, goes to church to feel good. The music, even if it isn't contemporary, makes them feel good. The preaching may be out of the King James, but still its message is about feeling good and about God getting you through the storm. And a message that gets everyone in a mood to shout and run the bases and all that stuff's good too, but there needs to be more of a balance. They aren't getting messages to teach them and prepare them for the war on doctrine. They are just hearing salvation messages and messages on how good it is to be saved and how to get through the storms. If you listen to the pop, most popular evangelists, that's all they talk about is getting through a storm and God's going to get you through it and God is good and God's going to help you do this and God's going to help you do that. And we all need that. We all need to hear that. But we got that. We know God's good. We know it's good to be saved. You move on to something else. They aren't learning anything about the Bible itself. And these men may be King James only, but they don't know why. For this reason, the average Christian who has been saved 50 years and went to church doesn't know anything about the Bible. And for this reason, the false teacher makes them look foolish. And ends up deceiving that person. They'll be thinking to themselves, well, I believed this all my life, but this guy's showing me verses against what I've believed all my life. That's because he's taking things out of context many times and deceiving that person who doesn't know the Bible. They just know the beliefs. And we're living in a time when church attendance and giving tithes is considered to be more true marks of spirituality than Bible reading and Bible study and even prayer. Uh, you don't want to become puffed up in your knowledge, but you don't want to be destroyed because of your lack of knowledge. There needs to be a balance. You need to find out what's right and look around and see what is being taught by other people and be able to prove it wrong or prove it right with the Bible. And I'm not trying to be critical by saying all that. But that seems to be a huge lack in today, today's preaching. Just look on YouTube and listen to the average, most popular preachers and evangelists. It's all milk. There's no doctrine. It's all about how God's going to get you through the storm. Every single message about how good it is to be saved, about salvation. And I mean... Once you get, people are saved. They know how to be saved. They believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they need to be taught the meat of the word. They've got the milk down. Now they need the meat. They need the doctrine. They need to know why they're saved. They need to know the doctrines of salvation, justification, imputation, propitiation, and all them words that sound big, but they're not really hard words to define. I mean, it's just, it's in the Bible, and if someone can study the Bible, study to show their self-approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 
then they're going to have a better Christian life. They're not going to be as deceived. They're not going to doubt their salvation because they know why they're saved. They know what happened when they got saved. They're going to know which Bible's right because they've compared the King James to the satanic versions of the Bible, and they can tell you off the top of their head what's wrong with the new versions of the Bible. They're not going to be deceived in that area. But people are destroyed because of their lack of knowledge. But next, a child of light should fellowship with saints. Ephesians 5, 11 through 12 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. If you're a child of light, then don't hang out with children of the devil. Uh, witness to them, be nice to them, and pray for them. But if you, if you hang around wicked people, then they're going to rub off on you. And I've always wondered why in the world, like you see some young Christian girls, and they get themselves a sodomite boy that they hang out with. Like he's just another one of their girlfriends to go shopping with or something. I'm thinking, don't you realize you're supporting his perversion? You're making him think what he's doing is okay because you're hanging out in support of what he's what he's doing. You're not going against it. Uh, I just always thought that was odd. A young Christian girl hanging out with a lost sodomite boy and becoming best friends with him. Or why would you start a relationship with someone who doesn't even claim to be saved? All because they have nice clothes or a nice car. And if you choose worldly people to fellowship with, it shows that your affection is down here and not up there. When the Bible says set your affection thing on things above, not on things on the earth. If you're a Bible believer, you need to fellowship with other Bible believers. And I wouldn't even recommend that a Bible believing Christian hangs out with a Christian who corrects the Bible. He will get you in, into his Bible correcting and, and to his contemporary church where they appeal to the flesh and use the modern versions of the Bible. They're, they may be great Christians, great people, but you don't want to hang out with someone who doesn't believe the Word of God. He could get you doubting the words of God. And although he is a Christian, you'd be fellowshipping with the unfruitful works of darkness. The contemporary scene is a work of darkness. The new Bibles are a work of darkness. And you say, well, I know the King James. I know that, that they take out all the verses in the new versions of the Bible. So I wouldn't be deceived by that person. And that's not true. And while these people are so ignorant on the Bible version issue, a lot of them are actually really intelligent people and Satan can use their intelligence to deceive you. Just because you're right on something that someone else is wrong about doesn't mean they aren't a smarter person than you overall and could deceive you. Ephesians 5.11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Second Timothy 4.2 says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Ephesians 5.12 says, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. You can reprove the things done in secret without speaking of the things a wicked man is doing in his bedroom. All you have to do is teach what the Bible says, and it shines a light that goes against his sin without having to mention the secret sins men have been doing specifically. For example, Jesus said, If you look on a woman to lust after her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Paul says, flee fornication. John the Baptist told Herod, it isn't lawful for him to have his brother's wife. You can reprove sin without giving dirty secret details of what someone's doing. And there are secret societies, but you can go against them just by giving what the Bible says. A detailed description of all the little bad things that they're doing really isn't necessary. All you got to do is teach the Bible and people are going to know that's wrong. Ephesians five thirteen and 14 says, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. 
Psalms 119.105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And the Bible shines a light on things so you can see the cobwebs and the dirt and the dust in your life. Ephesians 5.15 says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. If you walk circumspectly, then you are checking something from all sides. Uh, children of light should also free up time for God. Ephesians 5.16 says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Time is short and it gets shorter as your time goes on. I grew up in the 90s and the 90s went by slow. But the 2000s have gone by fast. You need to clear up so much time for God that it becomes the worldly things that need to be worked in. Uh, many times when someone talks about reading the Bible, they say you need to work on at least 15 minutes of Bible reading. Or work on getting in prayer or fellowship with God. But it should be the the worldly hobby, hobbies and things and relaxation that needs to be worked in. Like watching a ball game. You shouldn't spend more time watching a game or playing a game than you do the things of God. After work, family time, and Bible reading and study time, there isn't much time left. Those three things are important, and finding a balance on these things will help your life. If you're having trouble staying out of trouble, get a full-time job. When you're not there at work, spend time with your wife and kids, and make studying the Bible your hobby. You'll be out of trouble in no time. Watch your sins that you're having trouble with disappear. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Give attendance to reading. His word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. A child of light has spent time in the book and it keeps his light charged up. You don't want it to go out. Ephesians five seventeen and 18 says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. If you want to redeem the time, do things to keep yourself filled with the Spirit. If you're saved, then you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. But you're more filled at times than at other times. Fill your schedule with the things of God and you'll stay filled up. Like in Ephesians 5.19, it says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, sing psalms to yourself. Sing spiritual songs to yourself. The secular music will deflate you. But songs that praise God and not man or flesh will help you get filled up. And I like songs that have a lot of doctrine. The contemporary stuff just keeps the taste in your mouth for the world. And that's why I stay away from it. Ephesians five seventeen and 18 says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Being drunk and being filled with the Spirit are different things. One is right and the other is wrong. However, there are similarities. A person who is drunk is more bold and ready to fight the world. And when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you're more bold and you don't care what the world thinks. Uh, the great example of someone who I know personally that's uh, drunk on the Holy Ghost is my pastor, Donnie Dalton. He is bold as a lion. Uh, he's not ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth. Uh, you need to be bold in what you believe. If you have the truth in your hand, you can be bold in the truth. You're resting on that truth. You know what's right. You know that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. You know that the reproach and the persecution you get down here is going to turn into rewards up there. That should give you boldness. If you know the King James Bible is right and you know that God's on your side. If God be for us, who can be against us? Then that's going to give you boldness. And my pastor has boldness. And I want to stay under him and listening to him. That way that boldness will rub off on me. And you need to get around someone who's bold. More bold than you 
in the uh, the things of God so they can rub off on you. Acts 4.13 says, And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Uh, you can tell when someone's been with Jesus. Uh, unlearned and ignorant men can be with Jesus and they'll be more wiser and smarter than the learned and smart men. Being drunk affects your walk and that you stumble like a drunken man. Being filled with the Holy Ghost affects your walk and that you walk in the light like a child of light is supposed to. And even though you may be unlearned and ignorant, people will marvel because you've been with Jesus. Uh, being drunk with wine isn't redeeming the time. Uh, being filled with the Spirit is. Uh, giving your body over to anything you want isn't redeeming the time. Doing pills and drugs are time killers. They ruin your judgment. They're addictive. We shouldn't be brought under the power of any. Be not drunk with wine. We're in his excess. The excess is in the wine. One sip is too much. Be not unwise, it says. In Proverbs, it lets us know wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Use your time wisely. The name Budweiser doesn't make sense. It's not wise. It doesn't make you wiser. It makes you dumber. Your time can involve alcohol if you use it wisely. It's not worth your time. Ephesians 5.20 says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanking God in prayer is a good way to redeem the time. A lot of times my mind will be on something pointless or stupid and I'll think, I could have been thanking God and praising God and praying to God in my mind instead of thinking about something stupid. I could have been redeeming the time. So free up time for God. And also, favor your spouse. If you're a child of light, if you're going to act like you walk in the light, then favor your spouse. Ephesians 5, 21 through 22 says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Uh, when a woman submits to her husband, she is also submitting to the commands of God. God's plan was for the man to be the head of the house. In Genesis 6, 3, it says, Her desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Uh, and although this is way back in Genesis, this is something that runs clear through the Bible, even to the time we live into today. Ephesians five twenty three says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So the same way Jesus Christ is the head of the body of Christ, the church, which is all born-again believers, the man should be the head of the house, and there needs to be one head. If it's equal authority between the husband and wife, then it's just going to clash because both will have different ways of running things and different opinions. Ephesians 5.24 says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And the question comes up, how can I be in subjection to my husband if he always tells me, to do something bad, a woman may say. Or if your husband is trying to force you to do something sinful, then that would be where you draw the line. It's better to obey God than men, as the Bible says, but you can't use that as an excuse unless they're actually treating you bad and telling you to do something you're not supposed to do. Uh, are you really disobeying what your husband says because he's telling you to do something wrong? Or are you just wanting to be independent? Uh, if a man is doing right, then what he tells you will be the best for everyone. The fact that the man, the man is supposed to have authority over the woman doesn't mean he's supposed to be mean and hateful. Or it doesn't mean he's better than the woman. This part of the Bible is one of the places you can tell if a woman is a true Bible believer. Because these verses are hard for a woman to swallow. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So the man isn't off the hook. 
He has something that God commands of him to do as well. He has to love his wife enough to die for her like Jesus Christ died for us. If he loves you that much and he isn't going to lead you the wrong way, he's not going to tell you to do something wrong against the Bible if he loves you like Jesus Christ loved the church. If you have a husband that loves you enough to do that, then why wouldn't you want to submit to his authority and do what the Bible says? Titus 2.5 talks about a woman being discreet and chaste and keepers at home. It says they should be good and obedient to their own husbands. That the word of God be not blasphemed. And that's a rough verse because when you're disobedient to your husband, you're blaspheming the word of God. I know a woman who claims to be some some holy roller, holiness, thinks she's making it to heaven by her own self-righteous works. Yet she talks to her husband like a dog. Uh, tells him to move and to shut up and get out of the way. She's blaspheming the word of God. She's not obedient to her own husbands. She is a loud mouth woman, and she should be quiet, as the Bible teaches. They need to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, not big, loud mouth, obnoxious women. That is the most unattractive thing in the world. And these are rough verses in the Bible. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Sanctify means to set apart. If you're born again, then you have been set apart by God. So if you're saved, you have been sanctified and cleansed with the washing of water by the word. Teach your wife the word of God and read the Bible with her. This will cleanse. You'll cleanse each other with the word of God this way. Quit watching filthy movies together and read the Bible. Ephesians 5.27 says that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Your soul is without blemish. And that's your standing in Christ. And then your state is how you are living at any given moment in your life. It isn't without blemish. Because our flesh sins every day. But if we stay in the word, it will cleanse us from sin. If you read the Bible, watch your sin decrease. You need to be trying your best to make your state, which isn't, which isn't sinless, to match your standing in Christ, which is sinless. You're not going to have sinless perfection in this life. But you need to strive for that anyway. Ephesians 5.28 says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So if you love your wife like you love yourself, you're not going to mistreat her. Ephesians 5.29 For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as of the Lord the church. So a man needs to take care of his wife like he takes care of his own body. He needs to take care of her spiritually as well. He needs to teach her the Bible and be her covering. He needs to protect his marriage from men who want to take his wife. Jealousy can be good if a man loves his wife. He doesn't want anyone else to have his wife. Ephesians 5.30 says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So when you get saved, you become a part of the body of Christ. He's in you, you're in him. And this proves you can't lose your salvation. If he casts you out of the body, he'd be amputating his body parts. Uh, you, uh, God's not going to pluck someone out of his own body. Ephesians 5.31 says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. When a man makes a vow to a woman and joins with her physically, they are one flesh. And they need to not join flesh to someone else. If uh, the Bible talks about if a man's, if a man joins himself to an harlot, they shall be one flesh. Uh, you need to marry someone and stay married to that person. Uh, Genesis twenty four sixty seven says, and Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's ten and took Rebecca and she became his wife and he loved her, and. Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So it talks about Isaac taking a wife, and it says, 
He loved her. You're supposed to love your wife. Adam, way back in Genesis, loved his wife. He got put into a deep sleep and cut in the side to get his bride. Uh, Jesus Christ died on the cross and was stabbed in the side to get his bride. So the Bible teaches, love your wives. Even in the New Testament, when a man joins flesh with a whore, they are one flesh. But there is no vow, and God doesn't honor it. You, you make a vow to a woman, and then you join with her physically. This makes you married. And God wants you and one woman for one lifetime. He doesn't want you constantly getting divorced and remarried. Uh, Hebrews 13.4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. God wants you to take a wife. The Bible says it's better to marry than to burn. But you can't just go around fulfilling the desires of the flesh and committing fornication. When you go to bed with someone other than your wife, you defile yourself and that person. And God doesn't want this. He wants one man for one woman. And Ephesians 5.32 says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The church is a mystery. How could all born-again believers be in the same body? How could all saved people be in the body of Christ? That's a mystery. And how could all born-again believers be married to Jesus Christ at the same time and be his bride? You can't completely understand it. That's why I don't understand why people don't believe that there are many churches, many local groups of believers, but there's one church. The church is all born-again believers, and it's a mystery. Local churches aren't a mystery. You can see them. You know, you know all about them. There's no, nothing mysterious about it. The local church isn't the church. The church at Corinth is a church it has the people in it were in the body of Christ but the church at Corinth isn't the church Ephesians 5:33 says nevertheless let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband if you love your wife like you do yourself then you're not going to neglect her and stay out all night and play video games all night if you love your wife, then you're not going to neglect her and the kids and go do what you want to do when you could be spending time with them and teaching them and helping them spiritually. And the wife needs to reverence her husband. Treat him with respect. Don't put him down and criticize him. Don't talk back to him and mock him. And a good husband won't abuse his authority. A good wife will respect his authority and help him. God's plan is for the man to work and for the wife to stay at home and be a helpmeet. And this makes life so much easier and she can really be a helpmeet if she does that. And I know there are cases where she may have to work, but don't get yourself in that situation if you can by overspending and getting yourself in debt. Genesis 2.18 lets us know the woman is a helpmeet for the man. And if your husband works and you stay at home, then cook him something to eat, pack his lunch, do something for him. If he is worth anything, then he isn't going to criticize how you're doing it, but he'll appreciate it. And it really comes down to the fact if you both treat each other right and follow the Bible plan for marriage, then you're not going to have any problems, really. If you don't follow the Bible plan, then there isn't any marriage counselor on the planet who can help you. And it takes two. It takes both people. One following the Bible plan for marriage will go a long way, but not nowhere near as long as both following the guidelines for marriage. Why is it so hard to follow? Uh, God just wants you to treat each other right, and that's all it is. If you don't go by what he says, then you're just being selfish. A man won't love his wife because he loves himself more, and that's against what we just read. A woman won't obey her husband because she loves herself more than him and her pride gets in the way. She doesn't want anyone telling her what to do. 
But if both the husband and wife follow God's rules for marriage, then you're going to have a healthy marriage. But this has been Ephesians chapter 5 on being a follower of God and a child of light.